Amen. Five balls of crash tonight. You know, as the crash is going through this, let's ask the Lord that He would just have His way tonight. Ask the Lord for you, not just for you, but for me, but ask the Lord to, to you know, to speak to your heart, speak to your mind. You know, you never came to hear from me. You never hear, came from the uh, hear from Pev Church. But you came to hear from the Lord directly tonight. You know, unless we be led by the Spirit, unless we hear from the Lord directly, we don't want it. It might be this or it might be that, but you know, we have to be led by God's Spirit. So tonight, let's just ask the Lord that He would have His way. And you know, give us five minutes of your attention. You know, maybe the, the kids is a bit noisy, we've got noisy kids. All we can do is do our best, but don't worry about the mothers. Please don't stress and don't fret. We've all got kids, we know how it is. Don't worry, but I'd rather you take in from the world of the law than be interested in what, you know, we can, I can shout louder than the kids can uh, make noise. Don't worry about it. So let's pray and let's ask the Lord. Thank you. Lord, we just ask my God that you move by the power of your spirit. Lord, we ask, Father God, tonight, my Jesus, Lord, that you would speak, my God, that you would appear and I would disappear. Lord, I pray that you just speak to our lives and speak to our hearts, my God, through your word. Lord, we ask you to pray. We don't want to hear from you, man, Lord. Lord, we want to hear from you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, just take over. Lord, we ask you to pray. Thank you, Lord. From the Bible to the book of James, any, any guesses where we are? Good job. We're going to be in James, still in chapter 1. Now, when we were going through the book of Acts, we went through a chapter at a time because I think it would have took us five years to get through it otherwise. However, the book of James is a smaller book, so we're going to take our time and we're really going to enjoy it. So um, we're still in chapter 1. And we're going to be reading from verse 19. Everybody there? New Testament, so you've got like Revelations, Jude, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and then there's James. Right to the start of the Bible, New Testament. Does anybody need a Bible? It's our Bible study tonight. If you raise your hands, one of the brothers will pass the Bibles out. Just slip your hand up and uh, Peter will pass them round as he's coming round. So James chapter 1. Verse 19 says this. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. We'll stop there for a minute. You know, I was looking at this passage of scripture and something really jumped out at me, right? And there was a, the fact that it said in, in verse 19 about the implanted word, which is able to do a couple of things. And when you break them down, it says that, you know, for the, the, the word of God is implanted in our hearts. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Verse 21. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted words. Verse 21, sorry. Which is able to save your souls. You know, when I read that, I rejoiced in my spirit, because, you know, when we preach sometimes, right? And we're preaching the gospel with all our heart. We're preaching it with everything we have and we, you know, sometimes we're even raising our voice. We're passionate about the gospel. Why? Because we want to see our people saved. But you know, this Bible tells me that this word, it's not just a normal book. This is not just, a, you know, there's a reason that this is banned in so many countries. There's a reason why this book is illegal in so many countries. Because it is the word of God that is able to save your soul. Oh, hallelujah. Can we get that? Think about it for a second. You know, sometimes you think, oh, it's what I'm going to say, or what I'm going to do, or what I'm going to preach. No, it is the word of God. There is power in the preaching of the gospel. Amen. And when I, you know, that gives me great faith, you know. 
when I'm preaching the gospel, you know, it might be, you look out and you maybe see some dull eyes and, and maybe some people falling asleep. But you know, there's always that one person that the word of the Lord is just speaking directly to. Because it's, it, if we read the word, it is able to save our soul. Can we say amen? It says, receive the word uh, implanted. And you get the, the kind of mind frame that, you know, we need to be, have the word of God implanted in our lives. And you know, it's just a simple application of point, but what are you implanting in your life? You know, when you get up in the morning, you, you hit the, 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 for the brothers, we'll get on the sisters in a second, but for the brothers, when you jump in the van in the morning and you're headed to work and you've got the, the radio on, what are you implanting in your heart? Did you get up? Did you spend time with the Lord? Did you have time in God's world? Did you renew your mind? Did you do all these things? Or did you just jump in the van, head away? You know, me and young Connor was speaking, and for a while he's been, he drives to Glasgow for his walk. It's a long journey. But when he's on his way, he puts on like a sermon or he puts on the Bible. And he said that, you know, that when, when I take in the Word of God, it, it, it changes my life. I look at things differently, I, I act differently. It's because he's implanting the Word of God in his heart. But brothers, what are you implanting in your life? You know, when you get up and you go to work, it's all about the workmen, the jobs, the stress, the customers, how much money I'm going to make, this or that, the next thing. You know, because if that's all that's going in, that's all you're going to be is a nervous wreck, anxiety, worry and fear. But you know, when you take in the Word of God and you realize that, wait a minute, these jobs is good and this is good, but God is my provider. Amen. You know, when you're waking up and, and the enemy's telling you, go get this, get that. You need to get a new this. You need to do that. Or, or you need to provide for your family. So you need to make means by this way and that way. Wait a minute. When you read the word of God, you realize that God is my provider. Oh, yeah. That I, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. If he wants to bless me, he's going to bless me that day. And if it's 10 pound or 10 hundred pound or whatever it is, God is the giver. Yeah. You know, when we get a job, you know what we should say? Thank you, Lord, for that job. You know, there's been many times I've got a wee job right now for, oh, oh, I've got a crack a wee job there, so oh, it's a really good one. And I've got to say, God, forgive me. Because I can do nothing. I am a nothing and a nobody, and I don't even know how I ever get a job. But really, what we should say is, Lord, thank you for that wee job. Thank you that provided for my, my family today. Thank you that provided for my hope. That's what we should be seeing. But you only get that mind frame by implanting the word of God in your heart. And you know when you get maybe out and you're, you're, you're trying to get from A to B and let's be real, right? Let's be real people. Things get in. Maybe road rage or this or that or the next thing. And you know when you're stressed out and fried and you listen to all the rubbish on the radio. That's all that's coming in your, 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 your mind and your heart. It's what comes out. Because you're not taking in, you're not getting the implanted word of God in your heart. Can we say amen? amen. And you know for the sisters the exact same way. You know, if all you're watching is drama on the TV. You know, if all you're watching is people arguing and killing each other. You know, what's, them, eh, what's it called again? The programs, reality TV. Women are, ha oh, ha drama. We love it. We love it. But you know, that if that's all you're taking in, guess what's going to come out? The exact same rubbish. Because you're not receiving the implanted word of God. You're receiving all the rubbish of the world. You, you know, and what you see and what you look at and what we do, we end up becoming, believe it or not, sad to say. But it's the culture, when you let it in, it's letting water in your boat. But you know when you re renew your mind? You know, sisters, when you got up in the morning and maybe have a time of prayer and have a wee cup of coffee while the kids are maybe still asleep before they get up and get ready for school. You know that precious time with the Lord, you're implanting the word of God in your heart. And you're renewing your mind. So that's what's going to come out. And that's, you know, as a man thinks, so he is. I don't know who said that. I'm not, I'm, I've quoted it from somebody. But that's the reality. What we take in and what we think about, that's the people that we end up being. So when we take in the implanted word of God, guess who we're going to be? Christ-like. Can we say amen? The Bible says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You know, this word is just more than just a book. It's more than just reading it. When you read it, something happens. It cleanses your life. It cleanses your mind. 
It's, it's, you know, the, the, when we say, you know, that James says, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. But what is the word of God? What is the benefits of having the word of God? You know, I've got a few things up here, right? What is the word of God? Because when you're reading, I want you to know, you're not just reading a book or a fairy tale or me and Danny likes to read some fiction, Christian fiction novels about Israel and this and that. I've given him a few, he's hooked on them. But you know, that's just a book. But you know this word, there's something different about the word of God. It's able to change your life. And we're going to go through a couple of things. Somebody read me Psalms 119 verse 105. Psalms 119 verse 105. Just nice and loud, anybody? Oh, thinking now this is just things about the word. We're sticking to the word. What is the word of God, right? So it says your word is what, William? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Sisters, think about that. Where to go in life, what to do, who to talk to, many decisions that we have to make. Life is so confusing. Well, you know, direction, we're always looking for direction, direction. We've got fear and anxiety about the family. We've got fear and anxiety about our children, who they're going to marry, what they're going to do, what, what the future's going to look like. You know, we've got so much fear, so much anxiety. But you know what the Word of God tells me? This Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So that means simple terms. When you read it, the, the way gets illuminated for you. You know, you don't have to wonder what should I do in this situation. No, when you're in the Word of God, it is a lamp unto your feet. You know, when you think about that, just in short term, it's a lamp to your feet to, to, to watch out for dangers round about, close range. But also long range, it's a light for your path. It shows you the way that we should be going. It shows you what you should be doing with our lives, where we should be going, all these things that we worry about. You know, if we simply read the Word of God. It is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Somebody read me. Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 26. Ephesians 5, 25 to 26. Nice and loud, somebody, if you can. Wait a minute, Sandy. Say that again, nice and loud. Oh, some of the sisters, only, they lost, you lost them on the first start of that verse, husbands loved your wives. They were like, I said, we're out, that's all we wanted to hear. But the point and the reason it's Andy sharing that scripture, see the, the second part of it, about the washing of the world. Listen closely. Do you get it? The world sanctifies you. It washes you. And I thank God that, you know, it's, it's gradual sanctification, right? You are sanctified positionally in the sense of when we get saved, we are washed clean by Jesus' blood, right? I'm not preaching, you know, faith and works and whatever else. You do not work for your salvation. You are saved. You are washed clean. However, we are in this world. And what the Bible does is it, it cleanses our hearts, it cleanses our minds, and it sanctifies you. See, we are, we are sanctified, but we are also being sanctified. Does that make sense? Maybe not. But positionally, I'm saved. If I died right now, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You are saved. However, you are also being sanctified in the sense of your life is being cleaned up. But how do we do it? Well, it's by God's Spirit, but also, you can clearly see by Scripture, it's by the Word of God. It cleans our life. Wait, somebody read me John 17, 17. I'll read it for you. You don't have to turn there. It says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So how do we get sanctified? By the truth of God. And it says, the word is truth. So this word, this Bible, it doesn't, it's not just an interest in read. No, it will clean your life up. It will sanctify you. Can we say amen? 
You know, moral failures. I was speaking to Missy about this as I was going through it in my mind. I was looking out in my yard and I was looking at the weeds and the rubbish. And if anybody has visited my yard lately, you'd think it was an old lay-by somebody just pulled into. It's got that much rubbish and everything in it. And I looked down and I said, sometimes I feel like my spiritual walk is like this yard. There's weeds everywhere. It's overgrown. I'm trying my best to keep on top of it and do this and do that. You know, I'm trying my best to, to do this and do that and the next thing, but it just seems there's more weeds. Does anybody feel like that? You know, when you get saved, right, you look at your life and sometimes God's maybe by his Holy Spirit, right, that sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is cleaning your life up. And he shows you an area of your life where you need to pluck out some of them weeds. Right? And we be obedient to God and we listen to God and we do them things. But then you know what happens? All of a sudden you look around you and there's, oh, there's some more weeds over here. There's some more weeds over there. It's like they come out of nowhere. And sometimes that's the way the spiritual life can be. But you know the, the weed killer is the word of God. The weed killer, when we listen to the word and when we apply it to our lives. You know I'm a true believer in free will. It's no, it's no secret. Free will, and I think it's the same, you know. When the Lord tells me something, right? <clears throat> that's why you can see Christians who is, is flying on for the Lord. And Christians just been hit. They don't seem to go as far. You ever seen a Christian who have been saved maybe two or three years and already they're like here. They, they seem to have all the eggs in, in, in a row, or the ducks in a row, whatever it's called. Like, they seem to have everything okay. Well, they've got the same Holy Spirit that you've got. What, are we saying that the Holy Spirit only sanctifies some and not the others? No, he's the same Holy Spirit. See, the problem is we don't listen to him. The problem is when the Holy Spirit tells us what to do and leads us and guides us and convicts us. You ever had that suffering and that pain when you do something wrong? You think, Lord, I've done it again. I've let you down. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, you know, what have I done? How did I get to this point? Anybody ever done that? Is it just me? Am I the only real person in here that goes through trials and problems and you end up maybe letting the Lord down? You think, how did I ever get here? And that pain that comes with it. Just like Peter when he denied the Lord and ran out crying bitterly into the night. You know that feeling. It's a conviction of the Holy Spirit. But it's what you do with that conviction. See, you can take what I call a spiritual painkiller. And you can just put it off. And put, you know, and we are the best hawkers in the world. Our people. We are especially, you know, we're, we've been brought up to get a living in such a way where we, we knock doors and we, we tell tales even. Before we were saved and we, we had a, you know, it's always the, the be craftier than anybody else mentality. But you know, the problem with, this, that, with that is we can also hawk our own self. We can say, oh, that's all right. You know, it's just this or that. I'll let it away and I'll do that next time. God knows my heart and, you know, I, I've got good intentions. Bang, we'll take a, a spiritual painkiller to that one. And we'll do the same and we'll do the same. And you know what happens? Ten years down the line, you're still the same way. There's no change, hardly. There's, there's a slight change. There's slight growth. But compared to other Christians, they're taken off. What's happening? You're not listening and you're not being obedient to the Holy Spirit. But you know the word of God? It will clean your life up. If we, not just if we listen to it, but if we apply it, it will clean our life up. Can we say amen? Everybody still with me? See, many people say, I believe in God, right? But I believe in God my own way. I believe in God, you know, it's, it's, it's a God, a type of God, their God. It's something, in fact, it's something they've made up in their head. Because, you know, we, we witness all the time, we go to people's homes and say, yeah, listen, I believe in God. I do. Because our people, again, very religious. We've always got a Bible kicking about somewhere. Oh, don't say nothing bad about God. You know, we, oh, we won't have it. But yet, it's our God. It's our version of God. And when you say, well, do you believe, do you, do you believe the Bible, uh, brother? Oh, well, parts of it. Right, okay. And straight away, you see the problem. Is they have their own version of God. See, I can't take 50% of what Jesus said. I can't take 25% about this or that. But when it comes to this, oh, no, no. I don't believe that was written there. The Bible was written by men, you know. And then we get them old capers. Oh, do you not know it was written by men? Yeah, well, it was written by men. Penned by men. Inspired by God. Over 44 authors. Over 66 books. And over a, 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 a period spanning thousands of years. Of different cultures and different backgrounds and different generations. Yet... All pointing to God. Yeah, there's men who wrote the Bible. 
But any idiot with a half a brain can see that it's God inspired. Because it's all backing each other up the whole way through. Different men from different areas and different time frames. Yet all pointing towards God. Or it's written by men. Inspired by God. But you see, we cannot take such part of the Bible and leave the rest. That's not Christianity. That is our own version of Christian, our own version of God. I can't take the parts that says love everybody. Oh, that's brilliant. Butterflies and unicorns. However, when it when it comes to forgiving people, oh no, I don't want to listen to that part of the Bible. Can we just tear that out, please? I don't want to hear that part. Because I've got so and so and you don't know what he's done to me. Or I've got such and such and she said such and such and I I can't get over it. No, no, this this has got to be wrong. This can't be in the Bible. You know, you know, and you look at it and you give it a second glance, like, is it really telling me to do that? But you, can, you know what you do when you, you, you get that part of the Bible? You don't rip them out of the Bible and say, oh, well, I don't know what's happening there. Or maybe just take this part and that. No, you take the full yeah. counsel of God. You know what the Bible says? That all scripture is God breathed yeah. and is profitable for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness to be fully equipped. That's what it's for. All scripture. Can we say amen? Yeah. Not just some of it. So it's water to cleanse us. 1 Peter 2 verse 2. Somebody read that. New Testament. 1 Peter 2 verse 2. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the water, that you may grow thereby. Say that again, sir. But nice and loud. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the water, that you may grow. Thereby, if indeed you have tasted, tasted that the Lord is gracious. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Think about that, that, that milk that comes from the Bible that is able to make us grow. Younger Christians, when you get the Bible, and older Christians, it doesn't matter what age you are. You know, the Bible is, is described as milk to strengthen you. You know, when you give a baby milk, what happens? When it, mothers will know. Milk is, is it, you know, it's good for nutrients, it's good for its body, it makes it grow, it makes it go, you know, fat, it makes it strong. And that's, we, that's what the, the word of God is for me and you. You know, if you wonder why I'm always walking with the Lord and I'm always, ah, I'm never going back to that church and, oh, I can't be bothered with this one or that one. And, you know, if you, and then you, you, you clip yourself on and you think, what am I saying that for? I fell again. What am I doing? Well, are you strong in the word of God? Are you being built up spiritually, just like a baby with a, with a bottle of milk? Are you being built up spiritually, but with the word of God? Because you know, if the devil is in your home, and turmoil is in your home, and turmoil is in your life, and you never see me, you know, it's just a crazy roller coaster of a, of a walk with the Lord. You haven't been there? I've been there. You know why? Because I've got all the rubbish of the world coming into my life. And yet, I've got no strength and no sustenance in the word of God. It's almost as if, yeah, we'll read the word of God when I'm in church. I'll spoon feed you for, you know, you can't wait on me, Danny, Bryce, or Richard, spoon, spoon feeding you every Sunday. You have to read the word of God for yourself. To, 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 to take that nutrients, to, to spiritually grow to the point where, you know, when the enemy attacks you at your home, which he will do. The enemy attacks your mind, which he will try and do. Cause anxiety and fear and worry and try and strike fear into your heart. You know when you're built up in the Word of God, none of that happens. It's almost like, listen, go away. You know, we're in the Word of God. We're getting built up, strengthened. We're getting stronger. Can we say amen? Somebody read me Jeremiah 23, 29. Old Testament, Jeremiah 23, 29. One of the sisters is telling me, Ken, we don't just want, we're not chauvinists. Some of us are, some of us aren't. <laughs> Let's get one of the sisters nice and loud read that scripture. Jeremiah 23, 29. Nice and loud, Bella, say that again, nice and loud. Loads of kids. <laughs> God says, now this is from God's mouth. 
It's from God's own mouth. Is not my word like a fire? Is not my word like a hammer that breaks through rock? You understand that, you know, fire and, and, and the hammer, it's used for forging. It's used for shaping and molding and making. And that's what God's word is. It is a fire. You know, that, that will consume the rubbish in your life if you just allow it to do its work. And you know, it's a hammer that will shape you. And you know, sometimes, I bet you that sword or that piece of metal, when it's on that thing, you know, it doesn't feel comfortable getting roasted and hot. I bet you it doesn't feel comfortable when that hammer's battering down on top. But I'll tell you one thing, coming out the other end is beautiful. Coming out the other end is something that's just crafted to perfection. And that's what we are when we allow the word of God. Sometimes I read this thing, right? Sometimes I read it and I don't like what I see. Sometimes it cuts me. Sometimes it, that, that, that fire, you know, when you're reading, you think, oh, what have I done? I need to be doing this. And you, and you know what happens? It, it's sore and it's hard, but it shapes and it molds and it makes us. Can we say amen? amen. Hebrews 4, verse 12. That's the last one. Somebody read it. One of the sisters again, if you can. Hebrews 4, verse 12. Nice and loud. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Shh. Say it again. Nice and loud. Oh, we've got two years at one time. Say that again on you. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. Nice and loud. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Kathy. Amen. Think about that. The word of God is alive and powerful. And it's sharper than any two. So see the word, right? Now I'm just giving you what the word describes in the Bible. What the word describes itself as. But it, it describes itself as a sword that is sharper. And I've experienced this. Well, like I say, when you're preaching, and you know, it's, it's just cutting through. It's cutting through culture. It's cutting through family ideas, what we've been brought up with. I don't care if you call yourself gypsy, traveller, country person, doesn't matter. This word cuts through everything. It cuts through boundaries like culture. It cuts through, oh, you can't just say, well, listen, it's all right for me because I'm a traveller. <laughs> no, it's, you, we go on the word of God, not culture. You know, you can't say, well, you know, um, when you're witnessing, right? People will say, you know, this, I don't think I have to go to church to be a Christian. I say, all right, is that right? Well, do you believe the Bible? Yes. I think, yeah, got you straight away. Got you. Why? Because the Bible says, right, do not stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But all the more as we see the day approaching, encourage one another. Got you straight away. That's a command from the Bible. How about Jesus? We we'll use him as an example. It says he was found in the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. Got you again. See, it cuts through all the rubbish. And you say, any excuse you want to say, anything you want to do for living an ungodly life, we have the word of God. Amen. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It, you know, it, it, it cuts through what you think and what your ideas are and what you think is right. No, when you build your life upon the word of God, you're always in the right when you build your life upon the word of God, you're always on a, a firm foundation. You know when you wonder, is this right? Is this wrong? Should I go here? Should I buy this? Should I do this? Should I talk to that one? You know, all the questions is found in the word of God. If you would only read it. It is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto my path. Can we say amen? <clears throat> Matthew 7, right? I'm not going off. I'm, I'm staying in context. But this correlates really well with what I'm trying to say. Matthew 7, Jesus from his own mouth speaks about building on the sand. And it's the same thing, a man, right, we'll read it. Back to James. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing him, his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. 
And you know, my hairstyle is a bit dodgy tonight. Some of you said, what's up with his hair? Are you, are you started? Are you being too nice to even mention? Some of you were just looking like, I'm not going to say no, but his hair is a bit funky tonight. But I've done it deliberately. I never brushed my hair. And the reason is this. This is the example that James gives us. You know, when you're a Christian and you try to call yourself a Christian, you want to live by the word of God. Right? But your life is a mess. This is what you look like to people. How's that man number? Surely he must have looked in the mirror. You know, if I, I, back at home, I looked in the mirror and thought, yeah, I need to brush it. I'll get to that in a minute. And I never put any gel in my hair, never bothered. And I just left it the way it was. But that's the way we are in a spiritual sense. When God shows us something from his word. See, it says if you look into the perfect law of liberty and turn away and just don't do what it says. You're like a man that's looked in the mirror, seen all his faults and problems, and never sorted none of them. Or a woman, imagine you're the same thing. Hair all in a knot. You never sorted it. You know, the, and for me, listen, people always say, and I say, that it's, it's clear. The Holy Spirit is cleaning our lives up. That's without a shadow of a doubt. But I think you have an obligation. How's that? I think me and you have an obligation. And it's this. Be obedient. You know, if, if, in a sense, listen, it's, it's silly now, right? But if I look in the mirror and somebody says, go and brush your hair. And I'll go, yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. And I don't. You, you have that free will. I've got that free will. I've exercised it tonight. Stay at my hair. You can do that in a spiritual sense. You can come in. You can smoke and you can drink and you can you know, rip and you can tear and you can gossip and you can do whatever you want. But there will be no spiritual growth. You will be like a man that's looked in the mirror that's seen what's wrong but doesn't do nothing about it. You know, my brother-in-law Jimmy had a very good illustration of this. He put a bar of soap around the church. He said, he, try and observe this bar of soap and see what you can tell me. They're all looking at it thinking, right, what's funny about it? They're all trying to find out the clue of what he was talking about. But after it went around the whole church, there was no clue. He wasn't looking for anything. But what he said was, do you feel cleaner for handling that bar of soap? And the answer is obviously no. Do you feel like your armpits has been washed by that bar of soap? No. Why? Because we haven't applied it to a life. See, the word of God, you can look at it, you can observe it, you can look into the perfect law of liberty. But see, unless you apply it to your life, it's going to do no good. We have to apply the word of God. You know, the message is very simple tonight. It's not a hard one. Very simple. Not hard to understand, but hard to follow. How many know that? How many know that tomorrow, when we try and apply this word, that this is going to hit like a ton of bricks? How many know that tomorrow, when the brothers is in the builder's yard and there's a wee bit of a fiddle on, and you know, we can maybe get this or that on the side and give them a bit of cash, and we'll mason the people at a load of money in the builder's yard and just give it to them on the side, a wee, a wee side note. And then you get hit with the word of God. You're deceiving. And, but I'm talking to me. Let's be real. You know, there's an old saying, Jackie says, it needs gypsy too. <laughs> what you feel, I feel. What you go through, I go through. You know, when we wake up in the morning and you've got the, the rest of the day and the enemy's on your case and, you know, you may be this or that and the next thing and all of a sudden the word of God comes back to you. Don't do that. Don't do this. Go this way. Don't go that way. You will be led by the Spirit only if you allow the Spirit to lead you. We have to touch, we have to be obedient. Because i tell you why. I don't want to be, I've got to stand before the Lord one day and so the boys, the brothers. We will have to give an account for your behalf. Did you know that? When we get to heaven, we will stand and we will say, look, there's what we had. Your sheep that we looked after. Your sheep that we were taking care of. He is the head shepherd. We are under rows. We are like them slaves at the bottom of that boat in Charlton Heston film. Ben Hur. That's what we are. That's what the Bible calls us. Under rows. Rowing to the beat of the master. But you know what? My hands are clean. I have to teach the full counsel of God. Because when we stand before God. I do not want you to look like that. When you stand before God. I don't want anybody in this church to look like that. To be building all the time. To come into church. Having good works. Being a nice person. Superficial. And the house looks really good. But underneath. We're building on the sand. That cannot be. You know, with messages like this, because the Bible says that it cuts through like a knife. And maybe it's hard and maybe it's sore, but we need it. 
Because to get to the other side when it's all been said and done. When the race is run and everything's over now. There's no more cars to be had. There's no more bragging to be done. There's no more time to, to be living. It's done. And your, your account is there. What have you done with your life? How have you lived it for Christ? What have you done with the time that you had? Is that going to be your story? I don't want it to be. I don't want that to be my story. You know, uh, getting in with the skin of my teeth. Or, or maybe not even getting in at all because you've hit spiritual shipwreck. You've been washed away because all along you were building. But you were building on sand. You weren't building on the word of God. You weren't building on obedience to Christ. It was just some form of God. But denying its power. A form of godliness but denying its power. You know, you need to make sure. Are you building on solid ground? Are you building on Jesus Christ? Of the Bible. Not of our minds. Now, reading on, just finishing up now. The time's done. But it says... But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If any among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. But pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's it, Bible closed. Think about that for a second, right? James breaks it down. Forget all your you know, fancy dress and the way you want to look and the way you want to talk. And God is good all the time. <laughs> he's, he's behind me, so he's all the time. But you can say all the jargon. God bless your brother, God bless your sister. We can even get to know the jargon. We can get to know the right things to say in front of the right people. We can maybe even look the part and, and, and you know, we even think we're the part. But you know, one who is not deceived is God. He sees everything. He, sees, he knows why you're here tonight. He knows why you're listening to this world tonight. He knows why you're in Craigie Church in Perth. Is it for a man? Is it for an organization? Is it to meet your friends, your family? Are you here because you want to be led by God? Are you here because you've been obedient to God's word? That's why we should be here and nothing else. You know, it's simply, James, when I was reading this, I was kind of surprised because it was very, very short. And just, you know, when he gives a description of what real religion looks like, not just, you know, we, we don't even like the word religion. It's got a bad tone because it's, it's of works and it, it, it gets you thinking that way. But there's a right religion, proper religion, right? And what he's saying is, it's this, to look after widows in the troubles. Think about this for a second. Our culture, right, we, it's kind of lost on us a little bit. Because, you know, widows in this country, you know, we've got the government, they look after the widows and they're set up and they're looked after. So we don't really, the context is kind of lost with us a little bit. And even with orphans, the same. Now, I know I keep going on about culture and somebody that's not in the culture go, I wish this man would stop saying culture, but I have to use what God's given me, right? And our culture, I don't think there is a lot of orphans. Because I would die of shame before I let my family members be taken by the government. I think you're the same. You know, if some of these kids, God forbid, belonging to you, was, was left with no father or mother, and it was related to you, what would you do? Well, we'd take them in, wouldn't we? That's our culture. It's, it's a thing that we do. So, so it's kind of lost on us. But you know, in them ancient cultures, the most vulnerable people was widows and orphans. And they had to be looked after. They couldn't look after their own self. They had to be looked after. And it wasn't, you know, these men, what was happening is they were just snubbing it and thinking somebody else will do it. And, you know, we can easily translate that into, you know, a New Testament kind of really early on, late on church, right? Think about this. Do you have a need in this church? We have needs, believe it or not. Needs is all around us. We just have to open our eyes and look for them. Or in fact, better yet, you know what to say, Lord, show me where there's a need. Not to go and brag to anybody what you're doing. You know the Bible says don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. We give. In this church I thank God that we give. As soon as we hear a problem, see a problem, we've got good men and good women in this church that say, I'll put my hand in my pocket and I will give. Why? Because that is, that's proper what we should be doing. 
Not just coming in and looking the part. I, you know the Bible says that when you, when you see your brother who's lying in the side of the road, you say be clothed and filled and warm. But yet you do nothing to help him. That's not religion. That's a fake religion. It's of no use. You know what you are? A clanging symbol and just a noise. But you know you want to be proper before the Lord. You want to be a, you know, a true Christian, let's just say. Then start looking for needs round about you. Start looking out for the needs of one another. And you know what the Bible says, right? It says, I'm going to try and get this Greek word right. Episkeptomai. And it means to visit. I looked at the word, right? And it's more than just go and visit somebody. It doesn't mean that. But it means put yourself in the home. Put yourself in their situation. Put yourself in their position. We're not talking about widows and orphans, but let's put it to, to modern day terms in our culture. When you see somebody's need, that the bit of motor's broken down and they can't go to walk. When you see a need that, you know, a man's struggling and he can't feed his home, you know what you do? You don't tell anybody about it. You put your hand in your pocket and you say, here brother, be blessed. You help. And you know, you don't look for a pat in the back. The only pat in the back I want is from Jesus Christ. And even when, you know, I get asked, right, we all get asked sometimes, uh, can we give towards a, a, a situation? You don't need to ask who. Uh, who is it like? Well, no, we can't tell you. Oh, well, I'm not giving then. Why? What, because, what's going on now? Why? Because you, you, you want to know who it is and where it's going. And, no, listen, God knows where it's going. God knows the situation. You know, I don't need to know. And all I know is there's a need. And somebody's came and approached me. I'm going to give. Why? Because, you know, I believe that the Lord will give it back to me anyway. I'm not, I'm not talking prosperity, but I believe when, when we bless others. You know, there's an old saying, if God can get it, to, it through you, God will get it to you. But, you know, God, sometimes God can't get it through us. We don't want to give it. We know we're the most, you know, uh, hard-hearted people in the world that way. But, you know, if we want to be real examples of, of Christ, give. I'm not talking about this church, this building. Listen, I'm not talking about offerings and whatever else. I'm talking about real needs. I'm talking about people, brothers and sisters around about us, or even outside of this building. You know, we used to go in the, the winter time and, and feed the homeless. Get involved. See, I'm going to go and maybe I've not got money to spend. Well, I've got my time to spend. I'm going to jump myself in that motor and I'm going to help them brothers. I'm going to make that soup. I'm going to make that food. I'm going to go. I'm going to help where there's a need. Can we say Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Lord. We just thank you, my God. Lord, for your word tonight. Lord, we do not want to be just hearers of your word. But Lord, let us be doers, my God. And let, yes, it hurts. Yes, it cuts. And yes, we've maybe been challenged tonight. As I've been challenged this week reading this message. But Lord, help us be the men and women to stand up and say, I don't care what it costs. It's got to go. I don't care what it costs. If you say it's not right, then it's not right and I'm not doing it. Lord, let us be the people that you called us to be. Lord, let us be a light in this dark place. Let us be the salt of the earth. Lord, I ask and pray in Jesus' wonderful name. And all those children says, Amen.